We remember him as the World War II hero, the calming presence during the turbulent 50s, the man who warned about the military-industrial complex. But was Dwight D. Eisenhower truly the architect of peace he appeared to be, or was he a puppet dancing to the tune of unseen forces? We've all seen that famous grin, that image of a grandfatherly figure leading the nation. But what lurks beneath that carefully crafted facade? Was Eisenhower truly in control, or was he a master manipulator, a puppet master playing the game of power? Eisenhower, the man with the reassuring smile, the general who led the Allied forces to victory. We see him as a symbol of stability, a steady hand guiding the nation through uncertain times. But what if that image, that reassuring smile, was just a mask? What if behind that facade was a shrewd operator, a man who understood the levers of power, a man who knew how to pull the strings and make things happen? Think about it. He wasn't just some amiable grandpa figure who stumbled into the presidency. He was a general, a man who understood strategy, who knew how to command, who was used to getting his way. He spent years navigating the complex world of military hierarchy, of wartime alliances, of high-stakes decision-making. He wasn't some innocent bystander. He was a player in the game of power. And when he transitioned to the political arena, do you think he suddenly forgot everything he knew about power, about influence, about getting what he wanted? Or did he simply apply those skills to a different arena, a different battlefield? The political world is no less complex than the military world. It's a world of alliances, of maneuvering, of backroom deals, of hidden agendas, and Eisenhower was no stranger to this world. He knew how to play the game. He knew how to use his image, his reputation, his connections to get what he wanted. He wasn't just a figurehead. He was a force to be reckoned with, a man who wielded power with a subtle hand, a man who knew how to get things done. So was he truly in control, or was he being controlled by forces beyond his grasp? Was he the puppeteer or the puppet? It's a question that's hard to answer but it's a question worth asking. Because the legacy of Eisenhower is not just about what we see on the surface. It's about the hidden currents, the unseen forces that shaped his presidency, the strings that were pulled, the game that was played. We've started to peel back the layers of Eisenhower's image, question the extent of his control. Now let's delve into the shadows, into the realm of unseen forces. Think about it. Who really holds the power in any society? Is it the figurehead, the one standing in the spotlight? Or is it the individuals, the groups operating behind the scenes, pulling the strings, shaping the agenda? Eisenhower's presidency was no different. Yes, he was the president, the face of the nation, but was he truly calling the shots? Or were there other forces at play, forces that exerted their influence in subtle, unseen ways? Consider the Cold War, a time of immense paranoia and political maneuvering. Was Eisenhower truly shaping America's response to the Soviet threat, or was he responding to pressures from the military establishment, the intelligence community, the burgeoning military-industrial complex? Think about the rise of McCarthyism, the Red Scare that swept the nation. Did Eisenhower fan the flames of this fear for his own political gain, or was he caught in the crosshairs of a wave of paranoia that he couldn't control? And what about the economic boom of the 1950s? Was it truly a product of Eisenhower's policies, or was it fueled by a confluence of factors beyond his control, factors that he simply capitalized on? These are uncomfortable questions, questions that challenge the simplistic narrative of a president who was fully in control of his destiny. But they're questions worth asking. Because if we truly want to understand Eisenhower's legacy, we need to look beyond the surface beyond the man in the spotlight. We need to consider the possibility that his presidency was shaped not only by his own decisions, but also by the influence of unseen forces, forces that operated in the shadows, forces that may have had their own agendas. The truth, as always, is complex, nuanced, and often hidden from view. But if we're willing to dig a little deeper, to question the official narrative, we might just uncover a more complete, and perhaps more unsettling picture of Eisenhower's presidency. We hail Eisenhower as the hero who brought an end to World War II, a man who understood the horrors of conflict and yearned for peace.
But did that experience, that immersion in the world of military strategy, forever shape his vision? Did it, perhaps, make a truly peaceful world an impossibility for him to envision? He was a general, a man trained to think in terms of tactics, maneuvers, and victories. War, for him, was not an abstract concept, but a lived reality, a brutal chess game where lives were the pawns and nations were the players. So how could he, having spent years steeped in the art of war, suddenly shift gears and embrace a truly peaceful world? A world without enemies, without threats, without the need for strategies and defenses. It's not that he didn't long for peace. He did. He spoke eloquently about it, about the need to build a better world, a world free from the scourge of war. But his vision of peace, perhaps, was always filtered through the lens of his military experience. It was a peace built on strength, on deterrence, on the threat of retaliation. It was a peace that required vigilance, preparedness, a constant awareness of potential enemies. He couldn't simply disarm, let down his guard, and trust in the inherent goodness of humanity. He had seen too much, experienced too much, to believe in that kind of naive idealism. So did his quest for peace inadvertently sow the seeds of future conflict? Did his focus on military strength, on deterrence, on containing the communist threat, create the very conditions that would lead to future wars, future interventions, future struggles for dominance? It's a complex question, a question that cuts to the heart of his legacy. He yearned for peace, but he approached it with the mindset of a warrior, a strategist, a man who understood that the world was a dangerous place, a place where peace was often a fragile illusion, a temporary truce in a never-ending struggle for power. Ah, the 1950s. We look back with a nostalgic gaze, picturing a time of booming prosperity, suburban bliss, and the birth of rock and roll, a time of progress, of optimism, of the American dream within reach. And under Eisenhower's leadership, this image certainly seemed to ring true. The economy surged, new industries blossomed, Consumer goods flooded the market, and the American middle class expanded like never before. It was a time of tangible, visible progress, a testament to American ingenuity and resilience after the hardship of war. But was this progress as genuine as it appeared? Was it built on a sustainable foundation, or was it a gilded facade, a house of cards waiting to crumble? Think about it. This economic boom was fueled, in part, by the very industries that profited from war. The military-industrial complex, which Eisenhower himself warned against, was a major engine of this growth. The production of weapons, the development of new technologies, the expansion of the military establishment, all of these contributed to the economic prosperity of the era. And what about the consumerism that defined the 1950s? The insatiable appetite for new cars, appliances, and gadgets? Was this a natural expression of prosperity, or was it a carefully cultivated desire? a form of social engineering designed to keep the wheels of industry turning. The truth, as always, is complex. The 1950s were a time of genuine progress in many ways, but that progress was intertwined with forces that were less than benign. It was a progress built in part on the engines of war, on the insatiable appetite of consumerism, on a foundation that was perhaps not as solid as it appeared. So as we look back at the 1950s, Let's not be blinded by the nostalgia. Let's remember that progress, even when it seems undeniable, often comes with a hidden cost, a price that we may not fully understand until much later. When we think about the 1950s, the image of the perfect nuclear family often comes to mind. Well-dressed families in their suburban homes, everyone following the same script, striving for the same ideals. But was this idyllic picture of conformity a natural evolution of society, or was it in part a consequence of the leadership style at the very top? Eisenhower, the war hero, the man who projected an aura of strength and stability, was also a man who valued order, discipline, and a united front. He had seen firsthand the importance of conformity in a military setting, the need for everyone to fall in line, to follow orders, to work together towards a common goal. But did that same mindset translate to his approach to governing a nation? Did he, perhaps unconsciously, encourage a culture of conformity, a society where dissent was discouraged, where individuality was seen as a threat, where everyone was expected to fit a certain mold? 
Think about the Red Scare, the McCarthyist witch hunts, the pressure to conform to a narrow definition of Americanism. Was this simply a product of the times, or did Eisenhower's leadership style, his emphasis on unity and strength, contribute to this stifling atmosphere? It's not that he was actively trying to suppress dissent. He was, after all, a man who believed in democracy and the importance of individual freedoms. But perhaps his vision of democracy was one that emphasized unity over diversity, conformity over individuality, a vision that valued stability and order above all else, even if it meant sacrificing some degree of freedom and expression. And so the question lingers, did Eisenhower's leadership, his military background, his emphasis on unity and strength contribute to the stifling conformity that characterized the 1950s? Or was he simply a product of his time, a man who reflected the values and anxieties of a nation grappling with the uncertainties of the Cold War? It's a complex issue, a question that challenges us to look beyond the surface, to consider the subtle ways in which leadership can shape the culture of a nation, for better or for worse. We've talked about the conformity of the 1950s, the pressure to fit in, to follow the script, but there was another, more insidious force at play during Eisenhower's presidency, fear. The Cold War was at its peak, the threat of nuclear annihilation hung over the world like a dark cloud, and the Red Scare had gripped the nation in a vice of paranoia. Everywhere you looked, there were whispers of communist infiltration, of secret plots, of enemies lurking in the shadows. It was a time of suspicion and distrust, a time when neighbors turned on neighbors, when friends became informants, when careers were ruined by accusations without evidence. And in the midst of this climate of fear, Eisenhower stood as a beacon of strength and stability. He was the war hero, the man who had faced down tyranny, the man who promised to protect America from the communist threat. But did he exploit this fear? Did he use it to consolidate his power, to silence dissent, to justify policies that might otherwise have been questioned? He certainly didn't shy away from using the language of fear. He spoke of the communist menace, of the need for vigilance, of the dangers of complacency. He allowed the Red Scare to flourish, even as it tore apart the fabric of American society, even as it eroded the very freedoms he claimed to defend. Now, some might argue that he was simply a product of his time, that he was responding to the anxieties of a nation on edge, that he had no choice but to play along with the prevailing narrative of fear. But leadership is about more than simply reflecting the prevailing mood. It's about shaping it, about guiding it, about using your influence to calm anxieties, to dispel fears, to build a more rational and just society. And in this regard, Eisenhower fell short. He allowed fear to fester, to grow, to poison the well of American democracy. He may not have been the architect of the Red Scare, but he certainly benefited from it. And in doing so, he left a legacy that is tarnished by the shadow of fear, a legacy that reminds us that even the most well-intentioned leaders can be tempted to exploit our anxieties for their own gain. We tend to remember Eisenhower for his calming presence on the world stage, his efforts to ease Cold War tensions. But lurking beneath that facade of diplomacy was a different reality, a world of covert operations, regime change, and a willingness to use force to achieve American objectives. From Iran to Guatemala, the Eisenhower administration intervened in the affairs of sovereign nations, often secretly, often violently, often with disastrous consequences that would reverberate for decades. In 1953, the CIA, under Eisenhower's direction, orchestrated the overthrow of democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran. Mossadegh's crime? Daring to nationalize Iran's oil industry, a move that threatened the interests of Western oil companies. The result? The installation of the Shah, a brutal dictator who ruled Iran with an iron fist for decades, ultimately leading to the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and the anti-American sentiment that continues to this day. Then there was Guatemala in 1954. Again, the CIA, with Eisenhower's approval, intervened to topple the democratically elected government of Jacobo Arbenz, whose land reform policies were deemed too radical, too threatening to the interests of the United Fruit Company. The result? Decades of civil war, brutal dictatorships, 
and countless lives lost in a country destabilized by American intervention. These are just two examples of Eisenhower's hidden legacy, a legacy that casts a dark shadow over his image as a man of peace. It's a legacy that raises uncomfortable questions. Was he truly a champion of democracy, or was he willing to sacrifice democratic principles in the name of American interests? Was he a peacemaker, or was he a puppet master, pulling the strings of global events to ensure American dominance? The answers are complex, and they force us to confront a difficult truth. Even those who claim to stand for peace and freedom can sometimes be tempted to use force, manipulation, and covert action to achieve their goals. And the consequences of these actions can be devastating, leaving scars that last for generations. We've been talking about Eisenhower's interventions in Iran and Guatemala, but his penchant for shaping global events extended far beyond these isolated incidents. It was a mindset, a worldview, that permeated his foreign policy. And nowhere was this more evident than in his embrace of the domino theory. This theory, which gained traction during the Cold War, posited that if one country fell to communism, its neighbors would soon follow, like a row of dominoes toppling over one after the other. It was a simple, even simplistic way of looking at the world, but it had profound consequences. Eisenhower, steeped in the logic of military strategy, saw the domino theory as a call to action. It justified intervention, the need to prop up weak governments to contain the spread of communism at all costs. And nowhere did this theory have a more profound impact than in Southeast Asia, a region already grappling with the legacies of colonialism, poverty, and political instability. Eisenhower's administration poured resources into South Vietnam, propping up a corrupt and unpopular regime, all in the name of preventing the communist North from taking over. It was a slippery slope, a commitment that would escalate under subsequent presidents, ultimately leading to the quagmire of the Vietnam War, a conflict that would claim millions of lives and leave lasting scars on both Vietnam and the United States. Now, we can't place all the blame for the Vietnam War on Eisenhower. It was a conflict with many fathers, a tragedy that unfolded over decades. But his embrace of the domino theory, his willingness to intervene in the affairs of a distant nation, his belief that America had the right and the duty to shape the world in its image, these were all contributing factors to the tragedy that would unfold. So was the domino theory a tragic miscalculation, a simplistic view of a complex world that led to disastrous consequences? Or was it a calculated move, a way to justify American interventionism, a strategy for maintaining dominance on the global stage? These questions linger, challenging us to confront the complexities of Eisenhower's legacy, a legacy that is both celebrated and condemned, a legacy that reminds us that even the best intentions can sometimes pave the road to hell. We've explored Eisenhower's interventions, his embrace of the domino theory, his role in shaping global events, but there's another, even more chilling aspect to his legacy, one that casts a long shadow over humanity to this day. The nuclear arms race. Eisenhower's presidency coincided with a period of unprecedented escalation in the development and stockpiling of nuclear weapons. The world watched in horror as the United States and the Soviet Union engaged in a terrifying game of one-upmanship, each side striving to build a bigger, more destructive arsenal. The specter of nuclear annihilation loomed large, casting a pall over every aspect of life. The fear was palpable, the stakes unimaginable. And at the helm of this terrifying enterprise was Eisenhower, the man who had seen the destructive power of war firsthand, the man who had authorized the use of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He was a complex figure, caught in the vortex of Cold War anxieties, driven by a belief in the necessity of deterrence, in the idea that only overwhelming military strength could prevent the unthinkable. He embraced the concept of mutually assured destruction, a chilling doctrine that essentially argued that the only way to prevent nuclear war was to make the consequences so catastrophic that no rational actor would dare to start one. But was this truly a rational strategy? Was it possible to control such destructive forces, to manage the risk of accidental launch, of miscalculation, of human error? 
And did Eisenhower truly believe in this doctrine, or was it a gamble he felt compelled to take, a desperate attempt to maintain a semblance of order in a world spiraling towards the abyss? We may never know the answers to these questions, but the legacy of Eisenhower's nuclear policy is undeniable. It's a legacy of fear, of brinkmanship, of a world held hostage by weapons of unimaginable destructive power. And it's a legacy that continues to haunt us, a stark reminder of the fragility of peace, the dangers of unchecked power, and the enduring consequences of choices made in the shadow of the bomb. It's a speech that's etched into the American consciousness, a moment of stark clarity, of prophetic warning. Eisenhower's farewell address, where he cautioned the nation against the growing power of the military-industrial complex, is often cited as proof of his foresight, his understanding of the dangers inherent in unchecked power. He spoke with a chilling candor, warning of the unwarranted influence of this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry, its potential to distort national priorities and its corrosive effect on democratic processes. It was a powerful message, a message that resonated with, the, with those who feared the growing influence of the military and its corporate allies, a message that seemed to offer a glimpse into a future where the pursuit of profit and military might would overshadow the needs of the people. But here's the rub. Eisenhower, the man who issued this stark warning, was the very architect of the system he cautioned against. He had presided over the massive expansion of the military budget, the development of increasingly destructive weapons, the rise of a sprawling defense industry that thrived on perpetual war. So was this farewell address a moment of genuine contrition, a belated recognition of the dangers he himself had unleashed? Or was it a calculated act of self-preservation, a way to distance himself from the monster he had helped create? Was it a sincere warning or a thinly veiled attempt to absolve himself of responsibility? The answer, like so much about Eisenhower, remains elusive. Perhaps it was a mix of both, a recognition of his own complicity coupled with a genuine desire to warn future generations about the dangers of unchecked power. But the irony remains, a stark reminder that even those who warn against the dangers of a system can be deeply entangled in its creation, that the line between architect and critic can sometimes be blurred beyond recognition. And so Eisenhower's farewell address stands as a testament to the complexities of his legacy, a legacy marked by both foresight and complicity, by both warning and participation, by both the desire for peace and the embrace of the very forces that threatened to destroy it. We've explored the darkness of the Cold War, the nuclear anxieties, the interventions and covert operations. But the question remains, did Eisenhower merely reflect the anxieties of his time, or did his leadership exacerbate them, weaving fear into the very fabric of American society? He was a general, a man accustomed to command, to projecting an image of strength and control in the face of uncertainty. But did this approach, effective in a military setting, translate poorly to the complexities of a democratic society? Did his rhetoric, his focus on threats both real and imagined, feed a climate of paranoia, of suspicion, of seeing enemies lurking in every shadow? Think about the Red Scare, the chilling spectacle of McCarthyism, the witch hunts that destroyed lives and careers based on flimsy accusations. Did Eisenhower do enough to quell these flames of fear, to defend the principles of due process, to protect the innocent from the excesses of a society gripped by paranoia? Or did he, perhaps unwittingly, contribute to the atmosphere of fear, using it as a tool to solidify his own authority, to silence dissent, to justify policies that might otherwise have been met with resistance? It's a difficult question, one that requires us to look beyond the reassuring image of Eisenhower as a calming presence, a steady hand on the wheel. Because leadership is not simply about reflecting the mood of the moment. It's about shaping it, about providing guidance, about calming anxieties, about appealing to the better angels of our nature. And in this regard, Eisenhower's legacy is mixed. He offered stability and strength in a time of uncertainty, but he also allowed fear to fester, to poison the well of public discourse, to undermine the very foundations of a free and open society. So, as we grapple with the complexities of his leadership, we're left with a lingering question. 
Did Eisenhower help to heal the anxieties of a nation on edge, or did he, perhaps unintentionally, contribute to their amplification? It's a question that continues to resonate today as we navigate our own anxieties, our own fears, our own susceptibility to the allure of fear-mongering and division. The 1950s, under Eisenhower's stewardship, are often romanticized as a golden age of American prosperity. The economy boomed, suburbs sprawled, and consumer goods flooded the market, creating an aura of affluence and opportunity. But was this prosperity built on a foundation of sand, a mirage destined to fade, leaving behind a legacy of hidden costs and unintended consequences. The rapid expansion of suburbs, fueled by government policies and cheap credit, led to the decline of urban centers, exacerbating racial and economic disparities. The automobile, celebrated as a symbol of freedom and progress, contributed to the rise of car-dependent infrastructure, the decline of public transportation, and the environmental consequences of unchecked sprawl and the insatiable appetite for consumer goods, encouraged by advertising and easy credit, fostered a culture of instant gratification, of disposable products, of a throwaway society that prioritized consumption over conservation. This culture of consumption, while fueling economic growth in the short term, sowed the seeds of environmental degradation, resource depletion, and a growing mountain of waste. And let's not forget the human cost of this prosperity. The drive for economic efficiency often came at the expense of workers' rights, fair wages, and safe working conditions. The pursuit of profit trumped concerns about social justice, leading to widening inequalities and a growing sense of disillusionment among those left behind by the economic boom. So, as we look back at the prosperity of the 1950s, we must ask ourselves, was it a sustainable model for the future? Or was it a fleeting moment of affluence built on a foundation of unsustainable practices? Did Eisenhower's policies, while generating short-term economic growth, inadvertently set the stage for the social, environmental, and economic challenges that would plague future generations? It's a question that forces us to confront the complexities of progress, to acknowledge that even the most glittering achievements can have a dark underbelly that the pursuit of prosperity without a conscience can lead to consequences that ripple through time, leaving a legacy that is both celebrated and lamented. We've been dissecting Eisenhower's decisions, his policies, his impact on the world stage. But what about the forces operating behind the scenes, the unseen hands shaping events, whispering in the ears of power? Were there individuals or groups operating outside the public eye who exerted undue influence on Eisenhower's presidency, steering him towards decisions that served their own agendas. Think about the military-industrial complex, that intricate web of defense contractors, lobbyists, and government officials whose interests were deeply intertwined with the perpetuation of war and military spending. Did this complex, which Eisenhower himself warned against in his farewell address, wield a disproportionate influence on his administration, pushing for policies that benefited their bottom line, even if it meant escalating the arms race or intervening in foreign conflicts? And what about the intelligence community, the shadowy world of the CIA, operating in the shadows, manipulating events, carrying out covert operations with little oversight or accountability? Did this secretive world, with its own agendas and its own sense of impunity, exert a hidden influence on Eisenhower, guiding his decisions, shaping his worldview, steering him towards actions that he might otherwise have questioned. And let's not forget the power of corporate interests, the wealthy elites who stood to gain from Eisenhower's policies, from the expansion of the military budget to the deregulation of industries. Did their whispers in the halls of power, their campaign contributions, their access to the corridors of influence, shaped the course of his presidency? These questions are difficult to answer definitively. The world of power is often opaque, shrouded in secrecy, its machinations hidden from public view. But it's crucial to ask these questions, to consider the possibility that Eisenhower, for all his apparent authority, was not always the sole author of his own decisions. To understand his legacy fully, we must look beyond the man himself, beyond the official pronouncements and public pronouncements, 
and delve into the shadows, searching for the unseen hands that may have shaped the course of his presidency, for better or for worse. We've talked about Eisenhower's policies, his decisions, the forces that may have influenced him. But there's another aspect to his legacy, one that's less about concrete actions and more about image, about perception, about the stories we tell ourselves about the past. Was Eisenhower's legacy shaped more by his carefully crafted public image than by his actual actions? Did he prioritize controlling the narrative, shaping the way he was perceived, over enacting meaningful change? He was a master of image, a man who understood the power of presentation, of projecting an aura of strength, stability, and grandfatherly wisdom. He cultivated a persona that resonated with the American public, a persona that evoked trust, confidence, and a sense of calm in a turbulent world. He knew how to use the media to his advantage, to control the message, to shape the way his actions were interpreted. He understood the importance of symbolism, of grand gestures, of projecting an image of leadership that transcended the messy realities of politics. But did this focus on image come at the expense of substance? Did he prioritize appearances over actions, style over substance? Did he focus more on controlling the narrative than on addressing the underlying issues? more on shaping perceptions than on enacting meaningful change? It's a question that's hard to answer definitively, but it's worth considering, especially as we grapple with the complexities of his legacy, a legacy that is both celebrated and critiqued, a legacy that is often viewed through the lens of his carefully constructed public persona. Perhaps the truth lies somewhere in between, Perhaps Eisenhower was both a skilled manager of perception and a leader who genuinely believed in the policies he pursued. But one thing is clear. His legacy is inseparable from the image he projected, the narrative he helped to create. And as we sift through the evidence, we must be mindful of the power of perception, of the way in which image can shape our understanding of the past, obscuring the complexities, the contradictions, the inconvenient truths that lie beneath the surface. Eisenhower, the general turned president, a man who navigated the battlefields of war and the corridors of power, it begs the question, did his military background equip him to handle the complexities of global politics, or did it, perhaps, lead him down a path of militarization and intervention, of viewing the world through the lens of conflict and conquest? He was a man of action, a strategist, someone who understood the power of force, the importance of decisiveness, the need for a clear chain of command. These qualities served him well in the military, in it where clear objectives and decisive action are paramount. But the world of politics is a different beast altogether. It's a realm of nuance, of compromise, of navigating competing interests, of finding solutions that address the needs of diverse constituencies. It's a world where military solutions are often a last resort, where diplomacy, negotiation, and understanding are the primary tools of statecraft. So, did Eisenhower's military background help or hinder him in this arena? Did he approach global politics with a soldier's mindset, seeing every challenge as a battle to be won, every disagreement as a confrontation to be dominated? Did his years of military experience make it difficult for him to see the world outside the framework of conflict? to embrace the complexities of diplomacy, to understand the limits of force? Or did his military background, his understanding of the costs of war, instill in him a deep appreciation for peace, a desire to avoid conflict whenever possible, a determination to use his power to build a more stable and secure world? The answer, like so much about Eisenhower, is complex and multifaceted. His legacy is a tapestry woven with threads of both war and peace of military might and diplomatic finesse, of a soldier's instincts and a statesman's aspirations. And as we grapple with the complexities of his leadership, we're left to ponder the enduring question, can a man of war truly become a man of peace? We've been digging deep into Eisenhower's actions, his motivations, the unseen forces that may have shaped his presidency. But as we stand here, decades removed from his time in office, the question that truly resonates is this, how do the choices made during his presidency continue to shape the world we live in today? What echoes of his decisions reverberate through time, shaping the geopolitical landscape, 
influencing the course of events, casting a long shadow over the 21st century. Consider the legacy of his Cold War policies, the escalation of the nuclear arms race, the interventions in Iran and Guatemala. These actions, undertaken in the name of containing communism, sowed the seeds of future conflicts, fueled anti-American sentiment, and destabilized entire regions. The consequences of these interventions are still felt today, in the ongoing tensions in the Middle East, in the legacy of political instability in Latin America, in the ever-present threat of nuclear annihilation that continues to haunt the world. And what about the economic policies of the 1950s, the embrace of consumerism, the expansion of suburbia, the reliance on fossil fuels? These choices, while generating short-term prosperity, contributed to the environmental challenges we face today, the climate crisis, the depletion of resources, the mountains of waste that threaten to engulf us. Eisenhower's decisions, made in a different time, under different circumstances, continue to shape the world we inhabit, for better or for worse. They remind us that the past is not simply a collection of dusty memories, but a living force that continues to shape the present, influencing the challenges we face, the choices we make, the future we are creating. And as we grapple with the complexities of his legacy, we must acknowledge the profound interconnectedness of time, the way in which decisions made decades ago can have ripple effects that extend far beyond their intended scope, shaping the destiny of nations and the fate of generations to come. As we delve into the intricate tapestry of Eisenhower's presidency, sifting through the decisions, the policies, the unforeseen consequences, we're confronted with a question that cuts to the heart of leadership. Did he make the best choices he could with the information he had, or did he succumb to the pressures of a world teetering on the brink, allowing fear and expediency to cloud his judgment? The Cold War was a time of immense pressure, a high-stakes game of chess played on a global scale, with the very survival of humanity hanging in the balance. The threat of communism was real, but so too was the danger of overreacting, of escalating tensions, of stumbling into a conflict that could annihilate the world. Eisenhower, the general turned statesman, bore the weight of these pressures on his shoulders. He was tasked with navigating a world of shifting alliances, of technological advancements that threatened to outpace our wisdom, of ideological conflicts that threatened to erupt into global conflagration. Did he always make the right choices? Did he always choose the path of peace, of diplomacy, of restraint? The historical record is mixed. There were moments of wise judgment, of calm leadership that helped to avert disaster. But there were also moments of miscalculation, of intervention, of actions taken in the name of national security that ultimately led to unintended consequences, to blowback that would haunt future generations. It's easy to judge with the benefit of hindsight, to second-guess the choices made in the crucible of a bygone era. But the question remains, did Eisenhower, faced with the daunting challenges of his time, make the best choices he could with the information he had? Or did he allow the pressures of the moment, the anxieties of a world on edge, to steer him down a path that ultimately led to more conflict, more suffering, more instability? It's a question that each of us must grapple with as we examine his legacy, a legacy that is both inspiring and cautionary, a legacy that reminds us of the immense burden of leadership, the weight of decisions made in the face of uncertainty, the lasting impact of choices made in the crucible of history. We've scrutinized Eisenhower's decisions, analyzed his policies, debated his motivations, but as with any historical figure, especially one who operated at the highest levels of power, there are always mysteries that remain, shadows that linger, questions that continue to tantalize and elude definitive answers. What secrets are still buried, waiting to be unearthed, about the inner workings of Eisenhower's presidency? What whispers in the corridors of power, what backroom deals, what covert operations remain hidden from view, their full impact still unknown? Did he make decisions based on information that was later proven to be faulty? Were there events, perhaps orchestrated in the shadows, that influenced his choices, events that we may never fully understand? What about the individuals who surrounded him, the advisors, the confidants, the power brokers who shaped his thinking, 
guided his actions? What were their motivations? What agendas did they pursue? Were there instances where he was deliberately misled, manipulated by those who sought to advance their own interests? And what about the documents, the records, the evidence that may still be hidden in classified archives locked away from public scrutiny? What secrets do they hold? What light might they shed on the unseen machinations of his presidency? These unanswered questions, these lingering mysteries, are a reminder that history is not a neat and tidy narrative. It's a tapestry woven with threads of both clarity and obscurity, of moments of transparency and pockets of impenetrable darkness. And as we continue to explore the legacy of Dwight D. Eisenhower, we must acknowledge that there will always be gaps in our understanding, mysteries that may never be fully solved, whispers in the corridors of power that continue to echo through time, their true meaning forever elusive. We've explored the triumphs and the controversies, the light and shadow of Eisenhower's presidency. We've dissected his decisions, questioned his motivations, and grappled with the complexities of his legacy. And yet, the question remains, how do we reconcile the conflicting narratives, the divergent interpretations, the multiple versions of Eisenhower that persist in the public imagination? Was he a hero, the man who led the Allied forces to victory, who steadied the ship of state during turbulent times, who warned of the dangers of the military-industrial complex? Or was he a villain, a man who authorized covert operations that destabilized nations, who escalated the nuclear arms race, who presided over a culture of conformity and fear? The truth, as always, lies somewhere between these simplistic binaries. Eisenhower was a complex figure, a product of his time, shaped by the forces of history and the limitations of his own worldview. He made decisions that were both wise and foolish, actions that had both positive and negative consequences, choices that continue to be debated and reinterpreted by historians and citizens alike. So, how do we make sense of this complex legacy? How do we reconcile the conflicting narratives, the competing interpretations, the multifaceted nature of the man himself? Perhaps the answer lies in embracing the complexity, in resisting the temptation to simplify, to categorize, to force Eisenhower into a neat and tidy box labeled hero or villain. Perhaps the most honest way to understand him is to acknowledge the contradictions, the ambiguities, the unresolved questions that linger around his legacy. To recognize that he was both a product and a shaper of his time, a man who embodied both the best and the worst impulses of American power, a leader whose actions continue to reverberate through time, their full implications still unfolding. So we come to the end of our exploration, but the enigma of Dwight D. Eisenhower endures. Was he a man of peace, skillfully navigating a treacherous world? Or was he merely wearing the mask of peace, wielding the tools of power to shape a world in his own image? The answer, my friends, is not a simple one. It's a question that each of us must grapple with as we examine the historical record, as we weigh the evidence, as we confront the complexities of leadership, of power, of the choices made in the crucible of human events. But one thing is certain, Eisenhower's legacy, for all its triumphs and contradictions, for all its light and shadow, continues to resonate with us today. It reminds us of the enduring power of image, the seductive allure of fear, the unintended consequences of well-intentioned actions, the intricate dance between individual choice and the forces of history. And as we move forward, navigating our own complex world, grappling with our own challenges, let's remember the lessons of Eisenhower's presidency. Let's be skeptical of simplistic narratives, of easy answers, of leaders who promise simple solutions to complex problems. Let's be mindful of the unseen forces that shape our world, the hidden agendas, the whispers in the corridors of power. And most importantly, let's engage in this conversation. Let's debate. Let's question. Let's challenge the easy answers and embrace the complexity. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I encourage you to share your thoughts, your insights, your own interpretations of Eisenhower's legacy in the comments below. Let's keep this conversation going. Don't forget to like and share this video with anyone who might find it thought-provoking, and subscribe for more deep dives into the hidden narratives that shape our world.